um, uh, processing the trip. Um, listen, um, Israel was awesome. Jerusalem was awesome. And um, I cannot process it or unpack it for you in the next 15, 20 minutes. Um, uh, in fact, it's going to take a few days, um, a few moments, a few, uh, a few times that I, that I just sat down with the Lord and began to ask him, um, okay, I saw this, and this meant this, and what, what does that mean? Um, Israel's awesome. If you ever had the opportunity to go, uh, I would encourage you to go. It makes, it makes Scripture come to life because you can begin to recognize some of the places that you talk about. In fact, I was reading this morning, and it says he went to the Mountain of Olives. I'm like, I was there. I know exactly what they're talking about. This is cool. Because, see, a lot of times when we read it, in fact, one of the guys that was with me named Stephen Bishop, He's a, he's a pastor in Kansas, and uh, he said, you know, what I'm really anticipating that, that I, I've come um, reading the Scripture from 2D, but when I go back, I'll be able to communicate it in 3D. Because you can, man. You can say, I, I know what that is. I've seen that. Oh, I've, I've walked there. I understand that. And so, like I said, I, so thanks for allowing me to go. Um, I, I was a part of a team called... Um, the net or uh, national engagement team. Um, I, and listen, our trip was not just, some, 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 somebody said this to me, oh, enjoy your vacation. And, and, and I, on the inside, I laughed because it wasn't really a vacation. It was to some extent, obviously, because I didn't have to deal with y'all. But <laughs> I'm playing. I'm playing. Uh, uh, that, that was a joke. I smiled. Did you see that? I said that and I smiled. <laughs> and so... Um, so, no, uh, it, it was, it, we did some, obviously, some trip. There were some touristy parts to it, but it was really a journey. And in that journey, we were going to see, to hear, and feel God's heart for Israel and also for the United States. The national engagement team is just that. Um, over the next year, um, as a team, we're going to be visiting all 48 um, states, contingent, obviously Alaska and Hawaii, we're not going to get to go on, when I go on that, and I'm going to make sure Tiffany's with me, we'll go to Alaska and Hawaii, um, but the, we're going to go to all 50 capitals, and what we're doing is we're, we're calling, we're calling uh, the church back to righteousness, Amen. we're calling the church, we're calling the church back to a place um, that we would um, see and hear and understand. We're, we're, we're believing that our engagement team is to engage our communities, our culture, and our government. Um, one of the things that the church has done, and, and we've been afraid of it, um, and won't, won't get too, too far into this, but the idea is, is, is we've abstained from government, and because we've abstained from government, we see what the enemy will do. Instead of standing on our word in the midst of all the hoodlums, We've got to step back and say, well, I, I, I anyway. Uh, so the national, uh, national engagement team is we're engaging our communities, our culture, and our government and going to each of the capitals, and we're calling the church to righteousness, justice, reconciliation, and revival. Righteousness. In fact, Proverbs says righteousness exalts a nation. And so, um, so just a few thoughts. Um, as we've walked this. Um, first of all, um, I do not believe um, that the church has replaced Israel. I believe if anybody would communicate that, they, they, don't, they don't know the heart of God. Well, the church come on, so God doesn't care about Israel now because it's, and that, that's, that's false. That's, that's a lie of the enemy. And I don't believe that we've replaced, the church has replaced Israel. I believe that Israel is still the apple of God's eye. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 32, you'll see that. You can go to Zephaniah, you can see that. But here's the thing, as, as believers, um, we've had the privilege to be grafted in. Probably a better word than grafted in, because grafted in, grafting is, a, is an agricultural term, and we don't really understand that, but we might understand this, we've been adopted. We've been adopted into the, into the kingdom when we say yes to Jesus. And it's not by His law, but it's by His Spirit through faith. And so in Psalms 122, 6 and 7, it says this, and I believe they've got this here. It says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls, prosperity within your palaces. And so um, that, that's the, the, the scripture I would share with you this morning, that we need to pray for the peace of Israel. Here a few weeks ago, I, I, actually it was the first Sunday of November, 
Um, Mike McGee was here. If you remember, he was a, for 35 years, he was a missionary to Mexico. And uh, the Lord called him out of Mexico. Listen, the, the man, he, he didn't talk a whole lot about this, and I've not talked a whole lot about who he is. Um, but he spent 35 years in Mexico. Here's the thing. The cartel knew who he was. They knew his car. They knew where he lived and all those things. But you want to know something? He had favor, and they allowed him to minister because they, they, they appreciated what he did for their communities. He planted over 67 churches. In fact, there was one church um, uh, that, that the town was known as um, kind of this, um, the, 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 um, the place of Satan or the church of Satan or something like that. And uh, he went in there and planted the first evangelical church that survived. There were people that had gone in, but he planted it, and God gave him favor, and they began to do great things in that community and still doing great things. But the Lord called him out of Mexico, and when he came home, he was like, I don't know what I'm doing. And the Lord dropped this in his heart about the national engagement team. Last year, he went, he drove all around the United States praying and asking God, praying for revival for, for the United States. And um, out of that birthed the idea of the national engagement team. Um, they've asked me to participate. I'm still trying to figure out how, how and why they did that. But um, uh, I'm privileged. And because of that, because of being a part of that, that they invited me to go um, to be in Israel um, for about 10 days. Um, and uh, so here, here's a few thoughts. Well, I got a few pictures, um, actually four pictures. I've got more than that. I'm waiting for the team to send um, send more. I'm not, I'm not a picture taker. Um, I kind of just... I just kind of soak it in. Uh, but I did take quite a few pictures. But I'm talking, man, the team took thousands of pictures. In fact, there was a young lady that went with us. Um, it, it was just one of those things in the last several months. She connected with Mike, and, and she leads worship and things. And, and uh, Mike just asked her to come along to be um, a part of our a team as kind of on the worship side. And, and uh, I, I get to talking to her this week, and I find out that she grew up in Belleville, Texas, and went to the exact same church that I'd been a youth pastor at. Obviously, she was years after we were there. And I'm like, you are serious. And I'm like, and so, anyway, it's kind of neat, one of those connectivity pieces. But um, the first picture, I believe, that, that I have that I wanted to show you is the, is it the Sea of Galilee? Is it there? That's just, uh, now, now if you go, that's bad photography. Hey, well, I was there, you weren't, so there it is. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and um, the Sea of Galilee is actually a lake, but it's a large lake. And you see, we, we see in the story, remember where, where um, Jesus walked on the water and it said that there was a storm. We, as we were getting in the boat, a storm blew in just like that. And when we get on it, it's, 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 it's white capping. Um, and we're like, how awesome is this? We get this illustrated. And so while we were out there, I had just the beginning of it, there was a little bit of a storm, and about 10, 15 minutes it rolled by, and, and uh, even though it was still kind of rough, um, the Sea of Galilee. Um, it's also, when you read Scripture, it says the Sea of Tiberias, or Tiberias. Um, it's because it's the Sea of Galilee is in Tiberias. Anyway, um, so the Sea of Galilee, um, uh, beautiful place. Um, this is the, I am standing, I'm taking this picture, and I'm on the Mount of Olives. Looking into the city. This is where Jesus is coming back to. Uh, I'll tell you, this is where Jesus is coming back. And uh, just to see, just to, to get a, a feel for, for what all this is. Listen, um, you see the Golden Dome? Um, that's, that's, that is where the temple used to stand. It is now a Muslim mosque. And it is, it is governed and ruled by the Muslim inside the walls of Jerusalem. And, um, but we're standing on a mountain, and as you, yeah, I, I've got other pictures, but as you look down the ravine, on the Mount of Olives, you look down in its tombs, all the way down into, into the Garden of Gethsemane, and then it goes back up the hill into Jerusalem, and, uh, but that, that's the walls of Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem. The old, the old city is only, at this point, is only about two and a half miles, um, uh, two, a mi two and a half geographical miles, um. And it's broken into four quadrants. It's in, it's in, this is weird. But in, in the midst of this encampment, so to speak, Jerusalem is obviously a lot larger. There's a Jerusalem, I mean, there's a, a, a Jewish section, they call it the Jewish quarter. There's an Armenian quarter. There's a Christian quarter. And there's a Muslim quarter. 
And literally, the Muslims live across the street from the Jews. Can I tell you something? The Muslim hates the Jews. They hate them. I, I wanted to tell you something because I think this is kind of odd, or I think it's kind of awesome. Um, every one of the Jewish people there, they love President Trump. <laughs> they do. I promise you. They love him. Why? Because he's standing with Israel. And I'm not, saying, I'm not saying I agree with all of his politics and all things. I'm just telling you, he's standing with Israel. I'm going to tell you something. Church, we better stand with Israel. I'll, just, I'll leave it at that. I won't get any more political than that. But um, it's funny. I am, I am telling you, man, he's a hero over there. And you're like, you need to go back to my home. <laughs> anyway, um, and listen, like I said, we can throw rocks all the time, right? Uh, the third picture, Mount of Olives down into the city. This is the Wailing Wall. This right here. Is the this uh, little bridge thing is the wall is the walkway into the uh, in, into that temple area, uh, the um, Temple Mount I believe is how they identify it. But the Jews can't get over there. But they're on the west wall, crying out and praying, um, and got to be there. On two different occasions, on Thursday, I won't share the story today, but Thursday, Thursday afternoon, Thursday evening, which would have been um, um, Wednesday night here, we were there, um, and it was just it was a pow- it was powerful. Not because of it was powerful because of the the kids, the youth, the young men that were there, and uh, they invited us to dance with them, and um, it was awesome. Uh, that that's a whole other story. Hopefully, I get the video of it. And um, so that's the Wailing Wall, the West Wall, and then this here. Um, listen, this is not the architect uh, architecture uh, of the day. Of of this is the upper room. This is a Byzantine. This is the, the uh, all of that is Byzantine. Um, but we were in the upper room, and in the upper room, which they also identify as the place of the Last Supper, um, we took communion. We had to do it secretly. Um, but we got over in the corner. There's only seven of us. We got over in the corner, and we took communion together in the upper room. And then we just began to sing. Hallelujah. And man, it just reverberated in that place. It was awesome. And, uh, and so um, the upper room, uh, the Last Supper um, there, and, and those are, I, I've got many more pictures. I just want to take a few to, to share with you, a few thoughts, though, this morning and and, and I'll try to run through this. Um, if you wanted to, I, I, I don't have any other slides for this because this is just um, really from, from my heart. Um, one of the things um, yesterday morning um, before I had the opportunity to fly back home from, fly home from Houston, um, um, Steve, Stephen Bishop, um, he and I had, we stayed in Houston um, Friday night to catch the fly, a flight home on Saturday and he said this to me yesterday morning on his on his way. He was he was talking about um, the response and the responsibility of the church, and and something just reverberated in my spirit. And it was twenty four seven. So if you if you're writing notes, twenty four seven is is this thought: Israel or Jerusalem is in a constant threat. It's a twenty four seven threat. We we're not familiar with this. Um, after 9-11, uh, this is the other thing about Stephen Bishop, uh, which is really cool because I know, I know him. Um, he, he was one of the ones in the AWAC planes that flew President Bush back to Washington on 9-11. I'm telling you, do he goes, when it started, we didn't know that was going to happen. But at one point, we recognized this is who we are and this is who we're picking up, so to speak. And so, anyway, uh, that's a whole other story. Um, uh, anyway, uh, but, but Israel or Jerusalem is in a constant threat, 24-7. And, um, and listen, I, I, I don't know all, understand all the politics. Um, um, one of the things that we talked about while we were there is that Jerusalem is the capital of the world. And this is the reason why. Everybody's fighting over it. The Muslims want it. You know, Palestinians want it, which we can put them somewhat together. I mean, they're all fighting over, and, and, and the Jews who believe that, that it's theirs, and, and I do too, according to Scripture, that they're, they're fighting over. There are places in, in Israel that, that they don't control, even though it's an is, Israeli state or nation. There are places in their own nation that they, don't, they can't govern. 
you know the city of Bethlehem where the birth of Jesus, the, the, where, where David was from? They can't even go, the Jewish people cannot even go into the city. We had, we had a Jewish tour guide, and when we went to Bethlehem, he said, I can't go. He said, they, they won't allow me in there at all. He says, I've, I've set it up. You're going to go. You'll meet this guy. He'll, he'll direct you through it and all this stuff. He says, We're not, we can't even go there. Um, same thing in Jericho. You can't go to Jericho. Um, the only reason he could is because he, he, he was a tour guide and they allowed that. Um, but but there, there's such a dispute um, over, over areas. And it made me think of this. It would be like in my own house. In my own house saying, oh, well, um, your kids are going to do what I tell you to do, tell them to do. You can't tell them. You see this room right here? This is none of your business. This, is, this belongs to somebody else. And you're like, uh-uh, I'm paying for this. I paid for this. <laughs> I'm right. You see what I'm saying? You get that illustration. Um, and uh, so 24-7, um, there's a lost, they, they have a lost identity. Israel has a lost identity. Um, and it began in, or I say it began, I, th I think it was accentuated in, in, during World War II when Hitler destroyed all the Jews. They, they, the history will tell us six million. Well, it depends on which history book you read because there's, there's many that would like to revise history and say the Holocaust never happened. Because here's the thing, if, if the Holocaust never happened, then the Jews were never, were, were never viable anyway. That sounds like, that sounds like Hitler. Um, but they lost their identity. In fact, um, the, the, the tour guide, he, he, he kind of referenced that on several different occasions. And, and I remember sitting down with the team and going, did you hear that? They're still stuck. And I say stuck, I, I don't mean that critically, but they're they're, they're, their identity is still there. Here, here's, here's the thing, and, and we had the privilege of going through the Holocaust Museum in, in Jerusalem. And, uh, man, it, it, there was a lot of powerful things uh, there. Um, but if you don't know who you are, how can you do what you've been called to do? If you don't know who you are. See, the Holocaust stripped the Jews of their humanity and their identity. When it was socially, uh, socially acceptable to deny that someone is human or has value, to destroy them as a parasite is not difficult to do. Now, now let, me, let me kind of frame that thought. Walking through there, oh, I, I, the history will say 6.1, but they're at recognizing our 6 million Jews were destroyed during World War II. Um, but the more that they continue to look at it, it may have been closer to 8.4 million Jews were destroyed during World War II. And, and here's, here's one of their statements. Here's one of their statements in the museum. Why didn't anybody care? Can I tell you something? As, as it'll make, make you question a few things. Why didn't anybody care? Why didn't anybody do anything? It talks about when they began to, they'd isolate them and begin to put them into what they called ghettos and they'd put them in their own living quarter and their living spaces. They would take, they would take all of their stuff. They would take all their provision. They'd take all their clothes. They'd take all their, all their possessions. They'd take it and they'd give it to, uh, to the, to the Germans and, and then they would force them into these ghettos and, but they begin to, in, in reading and some of the testimonies, um, it would say that some of our friends, some of our friends, after, after they, they had dehumanized who we were and said we were just parasites on society, even our friends would be the ones that would come and assault us. People that we had, had been friends with, had, had run in the streets with, had played with, they were the ones that ended up being the ones that were, were, were being um, belligerent and, and harmful to us. And they said, how, how can that be? How can we change from one day to the next? Um, but they've lost, um, they've lost their identity. And so um, there's much more to it than that. Those are just two pieces of the whole trip. There's, there's many more things to, to think and walk through, but it's the pieces that really begin to, to set with me. So I would ask, what's our part? Matthew 5, 13 through 16. You are, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, 
How shall it be seasoned? It is, the, it is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled under, underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. Um, a city is set, is set on a hill, cannot be hidden, nor they light a lamp. Anyway, hey, look at that. I got a lamp. How cool is that? Um, anyway, um, I was supposed to pull that out earlier. Nor do they light a lamp, put it under a basket. But verse 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. That's our part. Be the salt, be the light, so that people can see our good works. Um, and, and so, um, 24-7, so uh, these, are, these are the thoughts. 24-7 Christianity. Um, not a convenient Christianity not, or a situational Christianity, which I'm going to tell you right now is false religion. Convenient or situational, or some may call it ethical Christianity. Um, it's a false religion but we're here to serve in 24-7. I, I, I have to have a 24-7 Christianity. Um, and um, we, we've talked about this. This is, the, uh, Susan, this is one of the things that just as I sit and, and I listened all, all, obviously last weekend to, um, to Kyle, but began to watch the, the four prayer directives that we've identified, identity, relationships, purpose, and generosity. Can I tell you something? The Lord just seemed to just, pound on that all all the days that I was over there identity we, we've got to we got to know who we are in Christ um, and and relationships and and things but our identity um, we have to know our position our promises and our power um, in Christ our relationships are more than just a social network network but opportunities to be Christ exemplified do you get that our relationships are more than a social network but opportunities to be Christ exemplified. Okay, I, I, I think I'll have to say it like this. Are more than social networks, but opportunities <laughs> to be Christ exemplified. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, so our purpose. If you don't know who you are, how can you, how can you do what you've been called to do? Um, the National Evangelistic or engagement team, I guess it's evangelistic as well, engagement team, is, um, is the church must return to righteousness, justice, reconciliation, and revival. Um, Mike McGee made this statement. In fact, he put it in his last newsletter, and he said, the church is dead. It raised a few eyebrows, uh, even people within our own, in our own fellowship. But the church is dead, and I said, the church is dead asleep. And it reminded me when I was in the Garden of Gethsemane. You remember in the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus went and he prayed? And he asked his disciples, hey, will you pray with me? And he comes back and he finds them asleep. They, they, listen, that, that, that is a parallel to who the church is today. We're asleep at the will. And we think we're driving. And really the, the truth is, is we're, we're, a, we're a sleeping giant. And I believe that it's, it's our place to wake, wake up the giant, which is the bride of Christ, to prepare her not only to love God, but to live for him. See, it's time for the church to awaken. It's time for the church to awaken. Um, and so what's our response? Um, listen, many thoughts, but these are some of the things that really just begin to to captivate my heart. And I, I'll be honest with you, I, I can say that, that um, there have been some places that I've been neutral and not, not, not just talking about, I, I, I've just been neutral, not, not maybe in my response. Um, or maybe I'd say, oh, that, that's horrible. And yet I would stand on the side and not do a lot. And, and listen, I, I'm, 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 I'm giving you just thoughts this morning. So, um, but uh, see, in the, US, in the U.S., we have our own socially and government-supported holocaust. Did you know that? It's socially acceptable, and it's governmentally acceptable, and it's called abortion. Now, listen, I'm not here to throw a rock at anybody. I'm not here to condemn anybody because I'm going to tell you something. The church thought that if we stood outside like the, like the world does and picket something, that's how we win. And I'm going to tell you something, we'll always lose. You know how we're going to win? Just like, like Tiffany's story, which was powerful. Instead of going mad, I'm going, to hit you, I'm going to hit you with this. They began to stand on the word and declare the word, and the word will cause people to, to respond to righteousness. So we need to love people. 
We need to give people, op, I mean, not, not options, but give people the opportunity to, to make other decisions and those things. And, and like I said, I, I, without just standing in that. But see, when, when, when it is accepted that a fetus is not human or alive, to abort the parasite is not a problem. It's just government, it's just a government, government sanctioned holocaust. And, and, and this is, this is the, the statement that I put on here. It's a social issue with spiritual consequences. I'm telling you, church. And, and listen, I'm not here to go, oh, you're bad. Listen, we need to, those, those women that have walked through that and struggled through that, we need to love them. We need to say, hey, there's forgiveness, there's healing, there's deliverance, there's help, and we're here to help you. We're not here to throw anything at you or to, or to condemn you. We, we, we're just here to love you because that's what Christ would do. That when we were at our worst, Christ died. And so when, when we find people in their worst, what are we gonna, we're, we're going to embrace them and love them and help them and, and give, them a place, give them a place of hope. But we need to stand. What's our response? We've got to stand for righteousness. We, we've got to really um, work. And, and man, I, without being able to tell you all the stories, racial, racial reconciliation in our, in, in our, in our nation, in our churches, and, and, and everything. And I'm not just talking about black and white. I'm talking about, I mean, it, it goes much further than what we're typical, uh, have an understanding of that. But there needs to be racial uh, reconciliation and spiritual awakening. And... Um, I, I wrote this yesterday morning after talking with Stephen and before he left, uh, and, and, and I, I wrote this for myself. This was my prayer. I don't want to preach a sermon. I want to be a sermon that exalts Christ 24-7. I don't want to just come in and preach a sermon and try to motivate you or encourage you or challenge you. I want my life to be a sermon that when you re that it that it exalts Christ. If you don't like it, that's your problem, but I want to exalt Christ. I want our church to exalt Christ. I, I want our I want our I, I want our ministries to exalt Christ. And so um, this lamp which I, I I was commissioned with while I was in, man, this was awesome. We were in a, we were in a church, which is also a 24, they, they pray 24-7. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, they're, they're in prayer. Um, we had service with them last Monday night. It would have been Sunday for you, but we were in service with them last, and, and we prayed over these because um, Mike felt like that we needed to be, as the national engagement team, we needed to be the Paul Revere. The red coats are coming. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Wake up. Jesus is coming. Church, we better take our place, our rightful place. And we better wake up. And we need to awaken our communities. We need to awaken our families. We need to awaken our government. We need to awaken our culture. And can I tell you something? We've been so asleep on the job. You go, it's, there's no hope. And I want to tell you right now, there's always hope in Christ. Always. Always hope in Christ. Um, and so let us be a spiritual Paul Revere and let us, call, let us call our nation, let us call our communities, let us call our relationships, let us call all those places that we're connected to, let, let us call them back to righteousness. Let, them call, let us call them back to reverence for the Word and a reverence for God. Let, let us call them back. And, and will, will it take on some social things? Yeah. You don't know why? Because even Jesus did some things that were socially ministering to people. And so, um, anyway... Um, like I said, I, I can't unwrap it all. There's, there, that, that's just a few pieces that, that happened um, while we were there and walked through a few things. And, and um, can I tell you something? I believe, I believe that the Lord is calling the destiny center. You don't know, you don't know why, why I got invited to be a part of this? And y'all didn't even know anything about this. I think, I think Mike, may have said, Mike McGee may have said this when he was here in November but he called me on the spur of a moment about 10 days prior, and he goes, man, we're looking for a place to meet, and your church is kind of centrally located somewhat for us. Can we meet at your, can we meet at your church? And I said, yeah, come on. It's fine. And, and so they met right there in the sanctuary. And then he calls me, and he says, listen, you're a part of this team because you, you offered up 
You offered up your place. He goes, you remember the story. I think the remember the story when Jesus said, go into the city and you'll find a man. And you need to tell him, the Lord needs, needs your, what well, we identified as the upper room or the place of the Last Supper, right? And he was a part of that team because he offered something that he had availability to. And we offered it. And, he, and they called and said, would you go with us? And, um, and so you're a part of that. I, it's not just me. We're, we, we are a part of that. And uh, over the next several months, hopefully you'll get to meet um, um, Daniel, one of, the, one of the other guys on the team, and, and, and Stephen Bishop, and, and uh, Mike will probably be back in at a particular time and, and different things. But listen, um, I, I'll, I'll leave it with this. Let us exalt Christ 24-7. Let us exalt Christ 24-7. And um, so, anyway, Father, I, I just thank you for this day. I thank you for your presence this morning. Lord, um, thank you for the privilege of being in, in your city, crying over your people, crying over Jerusalem and Israel. Thank you for that privilege. Thank you for that opportunity. Lord, um, I come today with, with many things stirring in my spirit and my heart, not only about that, but what I believe that you desire for me to do and us to do. And Lord, I, I just, I pray in the midst of that, one, that you'd give us hope. Two, I pray that, that, you'd, that you'd continue to be merciful to us and give us the opportunity to draw near to you. Lord, I pray that, that you would so impact our hearts and impact our lives, Lord, that we would become, we would become a voice we become a voice in the darkness calling people to your light, directing people to your light. And so, Lord, I just thank you today. Lord, I thank you today for your faithfulness to us in your precious name. In your precious name. Lord, I speak healing in this place. I declare healing. Lord, I bind the spirit of infirmity. And Lord, I, I pray that, that you, if anybody came in this morning, when they leave this place, that they'd be healed. Healed in their mind. Healed in their body. Healed in their emotions. Healed in their relationships. Lord, I realize that we have to walk through that, 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 that it's more than just that declaration. But I also know this, that we have to begin to learn to understand what it is to walk in our relationship with you, to live in our relationship with you. So, Lord, I declare healing. I declare freedom. In the name of Jesus. I invite you to come and be with us tomorrow night in prayer culture. Um, 7 o'clock. The Lord's calling us. He's calling us to a place of relationship that's deeper and greater than where we've ever been before. But we have to respond. Will we respond? And so tomorrow night, 7 p.m., we'll have prayer culture. Hey, ladies, be a part of, be a part of connection tonight. It's going to be powerful. Susan, close this out.